Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. Space, space, space. Hope you enjoy. Story number one. Human Steel. Written by Glacial Fury. The forge hall glowed orange under the mount. Doc of Fleur raised his voice to be heard over the hammering ringing on steel. Hi, he said. That's what they're saying. Human steel strong as dwarf mythium. Manius, the forge master, brought up his heavy shaping hammer, whistling down on a piece of glowing metal. Sparks leapt off the anvil in a fiery arc that died in the dimness of the vast underground chamber. Again and again, the hammer fell, and Manus slowly forced the metal to yield to his will. Said that today, Manus's voice was gruff with a slight rasp from centuries of laboring in the dim heat and haze under the mountain. Talk's only talk, he said, with a continued to work, his heavy hammer guided effortlessly by the heavy muscled arm. What's King Braun say? Dockerflow agreed that talk was empty air until proven otherwise, but the humans were confident in their improvements on dwarven techniques, and this time they said proof. King Braun said the forge all is yours and by rights your decision, Dockerflow said, crossing his arms over his tunic suddenly feeling a bit out of place. He was the only dwarf present who wasn't wearing a beard apron, bare-chested, with slag-scarred hands and soot settled into the muscular grooves of his chest. Raised to be an ambassador like his father before him, Dockerfleur would never wield a hammer in the forge hall. Whatever you decide, he supports you. Also, said the darn fool should know after all these years. Manus traded his hammer for a pair of large pincers and took up the glowing metal. The work was part of him, ingrained in his bones. He no longer needed to think about what must be done. His hands simply made it happen. A smile split white above the beard apron. I, I know, still good to hear. A good dwarf, my king. The water in the trough hissed and frothed when Manus thrust the steel into its embrace. All around, dwarves worked similar anvil platforms, fronting the long rows of forges carved directly into the stone of the mountain. Their muscled backs glistened in the orange shadows of the forge hall. Manus retracted the newly quenched metal from the trough and tossed it into the glowing maw of the forge, turning to look at Dockerfla for the first time. His face was flat and hammered like a metal he worked, with dusky grey eyes lined on both sides. Honed sharp with the wisdom of only age can bring. He pursed his lips, a slight pinching together of the moustache and beard apron. I see no harm in having a human about, so long as they don't cause my dwarves trouble. Yeah, you'll be along convincing one of my boys they'll be wanting to spend any time in a human city, working with them, what they call smithies. Dockerfler agreed, save one thing. Got me a volunteer? He fought back the grin that twitched on his lips as a surprise on Manus's face. Volunteer, aye, Dockerfler said, pointing down the line of forgers to a distant figure, with a hair a color of fire, broad of shoulders, and muscled as any dwarf had ever been. Aethel's eager to see the human lands and uh, what they're about. Uh, the old stories have uh, his beard filled with wonders. Uh, he was quick to volunteer, he was. Manus followed Dalkufer's finger across the great chamber. You talk to me, dwarves, without myself first. Anger stimmered under the flat calm of his voice. Hazel, is it? He's a pop with me a hundred years under his head. Can't be letting him drapes off to the god knows where with such a tender age. Manus was shaking his head firmly. Maybe another fifty or hundred years and he can go. You hadn't seen a sentry when you started your travels, Dockerfer pointed out. Terrible to ever steal. Before you was a hundred, you did. Manus looked at him sharply, lips pursed again, considering. Aye, I remember, Dockerfer said. It was all the grand affair, and you argued with your father, and the forge master, yet ye was more old than enough to go. I remember he thought as ye did now, but relented in the end. Hard to let go, they say. Manus lifted his chin, a stubborn light in those great eyes. Then he sighed and blew out his moustache, scrubbing a gnarled hand across his face. Aye, I, I remember well, dwarf. 
he said, his eyes momentarily misting with memories. Send the pop, then. But hear me well, dwarf. Manus smashed the tip of his nose into Dockerfer's, stabbing the stubby finger into the delicate fabric of his tunic. If anything befalls the lad while he's away, I'll be coming for your beard, and don't ye be thinking there'll be anything to stop me. Dockerfer believed him, spreading his hands wide and nodding in an understanding. I'll be looking after the young stallion, I will. No arm will come to him on my beard. Manus stepped back, seemingly mollified. Good. Good, yeah, you yeah, understand. Then these humans of yours send a sample. Dockerfla smiled, slipping a hand inside of his tunic. It was a black satin scabbard traced by unpolished silver. The blade hissed from its sheath. The soft whisper of a master craftsmanship, polished steel and dark blue swirls running along the gleaming length. Manus's eyes fell upon it with a grudging appreciation. Aye, was all the forge master managed to say. His eyes were mesmerized by the magnificent weapon and how the light played over the rich steel. It was perfectly balanced and light in his hand, a pleasure to hold. He ran a thumb along the razor-fine edge, whistling in appreciation. Then his face jerked up. You and steel, I, plain old iron, I pulled out of the ills under their keep. Not a fleck of lithium in it. Manus's brows tried to lift right off his forehead, and he nodded. Moving towards the testing bench, he hammered at the sword, vented in vice, and Dockerfla watched it spring back into shape. Good as ever. Manus doused it with acid, beat it with chisels, and subjected it to blue swirling steel to every torture, shy of tossing it into the molten depths of a volcano. When he finished, he scrubbed sweat from his brow and turned to Dockerfla. Something strange glinted in his eyes. Send word to your humans. His voice was gruff, grudging, and impressed. We accept their offer and exchange our ways. His eyes went back to the sword, then returned to Dockerfla. In all me years, I've never had a blade steel with such strength and durability. If they'll be sharing their secrets, we'll be listening. I have the parchment written in my chamber, Dockerfla said. Just need yours and the king's seal for the delicate. Aye, do it. Manus held the sword in his arm's length, admiring how the forge hall's orange light ran warm along the metal. Only a stubborn old fool would turn away from learning how to work the metal with such mastery. Even from a human. Might be it's the truth. End of story. Story number two. Soul 1000. Written by Glitch Key. Come, but other requirements for me to race into Soul 1000. Your ship does not meet the minimum safety specifications. I'm aware of that. What are the minimum safety specifications and how much would a retrofit cost? Minimum safety specifications for the Sol 1000 are M-Spec Gravity Stabilization for Pilot Capsule, 10,000 credits. M-Spec Shielding Against Heat, Cold, Pressure, Vacuum, EM, Kinetic and Magnetic Damage, 40,000 credits. M-Spec Aerodynamics Hull Rebuild, 100,000 credits. M-Spec Self-Powered Wormhole-Based Emergency Escape Device for Pilot Capsule, 90,000 credits. M-Spec Thrust Control and Deacceleration Modifications to all forms of mobility, 30,000 credits. Miscellaneous other small modifications for pilot safety, 123,000 credits. A full retrofit would be a total of approximately 393,000 credits, and a similar cost would be required to downgrade your ship if you wish to participate in a standard intergalactic circuit event afterwards. Oh, well, um, I occupy a mid-range battle cruiser for that. What am I going to be doing? Driving into a gas giant? Y yes. A slightly past the halfway point in the race, you would be expected to take a 20-mile dive into the fifth punt in the system, through a jump ring installed deep within the atmosphere for the race. Is that the most dangerous part of the race? Statistically, that is the least dangerous major obstacle. Computer, list the primary obstacles for the Sol 1000 in order from least to most dangerous amid the gas giant. In order from least to most dangerous, you will make a run through the system's outer debris field at relativistic speeds. You will make a ten-mile run through the moon made primarily of water. You will run along the surface of their star for one hundred miles. You will run through a large abandoned colony station maintained explicitly for the Sol 1000. 
You will run through the detritus of a hundred-year-old battle with live mines and active military drones which will attempt to intercept and destroy any nearby craft. Well, uh, Kavira, what are the expected benefits if I do well in the Soul 1000? The sponsor value of a player who places in the top three in the Soul 1000 increases by an average of 5,000%. With rapidly diminishing returns for every human race participated in until the tenth, at which point pilots are banned from the standard intergalactic circuit under the same policies that ban humans as a hazard to the well being of races. Yeah, yeah, another rules. Hmm. Earlier, you started to upgrade specifications were higher than military spec. Uh, do those specifications have a name? Officially, there is no name for a build specifications of that caliber. Unofficially, they are referred to as. Human spec. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the Tier 5 members, Marky, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnolds, Oakfield, Lord Azrakul, and it's difficult to pronounce. Thank you very much.